The following podcast contains language and themes that some people may find offensive. It also contains conversations about drugs and cats shitting where they shouldn't. The standard thing we're used to from this podcast. Enjoy! Hello and welcome to That Was The Week That Was, Was It? The podcast that is too nosy for its own good. Joining me for this episode is Emmy Weber. You all right, Emmy? Hello. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. Good? Yeah. Your afternoon nap? I've had my afternoon nap, yeah. Good. I'm refreshed. Oh, good. I needed one, but I didn't have one. Um, so our guest for this episode is the improv comedy legend, Mike McShane. How are you, Mike? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right, Alex. Hi, Emmy. Um, Hi. Just uh, trapped in the back of the house here. We have some DIY and construction going on. Oh, uh, before I leave, I'm coming to the UK uh, at the end of March to tour with Paul Merton. Fantastic. How long are you in the UK for? Uh, we'll be here until I think our tour runs from March 24th to June 14th. Oh, oh nice. Then, uh, yeah, my wife and I are going to, she's going to come in later and we're going to spend uh, the rest of June toddling around the UK, Why seeing not? friends and uh, enjoying the find, uh, the find, uh, I think we're going to go south. She's never really been south to like Hastings and New oh, Forest. Okay. Yep. So I'm trying to find a place where I guarantee where a horse will stick its head in your bedroom. It's like seven in the morning to wake you up. A stable? Yeah, yeah a stable. Exactly. You know, but yeah, I don't want to get too close to the Jesus thing. Next thing you got three guys showing up with gifts. Yeah. You're getting enunciated and then people are following you and they don't really listen to what you say. And then yes, it's completely off the rails. Yeah, it, it gets out of control after a while. I prefer just to eat some mushrooms and stare at a horse for 10 hours, you know, That's fair. down, That's down fair. in the New Forest. Yeah. I did that once. Nobody told me about that. Oh, really? No. Yeah, I oh. stayed at a friend's place. Let me stay for like a couple of weeks. And uh, he made his own uh, beer, and he had it all ready. And so I just drank beer, ate mushrooms, and watched cows turn different colors in my uh, doorway. Wow. It was a nice gig. It was really nice. It was, you know, yeah. lost That's a lot nice. of time. And uh, a lot of a uh, lot of brain cells, <laughs> but that's, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that sounds a nice way to enjoy nature. Yeah, and it's a good way to lose your brain cells because there's many other ways you can do it. Yeah, you know, many I came them. up in that time where the whole thing was to, you know, survive Vietnam, uh, get up in the woods in California, live in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> until you went, man, this looted a tree thing, the, the raccoons are throwing me out. I better go move to a city. Oh, I'll go to San Francisco. And that's how I went up and doing improv and being an actor. Well, so there's never great. had a career. I never had a career trajectory. Uh, it all happens, though, doesn't it, when you go to the city, if you stay in the sticks. Or if you get kicked out your tree. Or if you get kicked out your tree. Kicked out your tree. Well, that's how civilization started with us, at least. You know, the first monkey, somebody going, out, you. You don't clean up after yourself. You're shitting <laughs> over here. We're eating over here. And you keep mixing it up. We can't have it. Go get a job. You know? yeah. Fine. Yeah, I'll be coming improvising. Yeah. Fine. Um, so, anyway, your, I just want to address your credit list on IMDb, because I, I do a little bit of back research on people. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely varied, Mike. Extremely I do not speak for the World Bank. Y yeah. <laughs> Oh, credit. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything from Seinfeld to Bugs Life, Office Space, Treasure Planet, yeah, everything. I mean, Robin but, Hood? well, that's what I want to briefly touch upon is Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I'm sure you've never been asked questions about Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Mike. Never in <laughs> my entire adult life. To me, it's, it's, it's a favorite of mine. It's like a, it's almost like a big budget Hollywood remake or version of a British pantomime in a way. It's so, like, bombastic and over the top, and Alan Rickman is clearly chewing the scenery, and ev everyone's having a great time. Um, I just I wonder what that experience, briefly, was like for you. Well, it was thrilling. It was my first big role in a movie. And it was strange, too. I auditioned for it in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, they passed on me, like, right after my first audition. So I was like, okay, and I forgot about it. And I got over to do Whose Line?, and I got a call uh, from David Zimmerman, who was the casting director for it. Mm. And he said, the guy, Kevin uh, Reynolds would like to see you. And I was like, I already, he goes, don't worry about that one. He's going to do this one. And I think I was very confident by that point because I was getting embraced by your country so yeah. much for doing whose yeah. line. It was, 
it was like an actor's dream. Oh, these are the guys that American actors dream. These are the guys who like Shakespeare. They think I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So yeah. you're kind of like, wow. So I was very confident and ebullient, and I got to meet with the director, which is a distinct advantage when you're an actor in film. In theater, yeah, you always meet the director. You go on audition for the director, you know. Yeah. Um, he's usually even there, you know, there for uh, plays. But for movies, there's so many gates, more gates. And so it was just him and I just a bullion and large. I was large. I mean, I was at the Royal Court. They were coming downstairs going, stop that. They didn't know what I was doing. I was just making so much noise. But mm. I got it. And so we went to read, we did the table read, and, you know, it was an okay script, and they were going to keep writing as it went along. And I was kind of like, you know, like a an infant. I was just like, my eyes were big, my ears were big. I've been very lucky, and I've been very spoiled. My first time on a movie set was Peggy Sue Got Married oh, with Francis Ford Coppola. And I yeah. got my my actor's union card from him because uh, he wanted to cast me, but I was doing a play in San Francisco and uh, I couldn't get, I couldn't just throw that out the window. I don't like doing that. And he's cool because he's from San Francisco. And he went, well, okay, well, listen, we'll bring you up as an extra. It's less responsibility. You get paid. And if your scene comes up, then we'll do a thing called Taft Hartley. You win. You sign into the union immediately. Mm. They make you a union member of that. And then basically whatever you got paid for the movie goes to your first union dues. But it's, a, it's an entree into the union, which I wanted. And so while I was there, the scene came up. I had a scene, did it, got signed in, and then spent the rest of the time walking around just, like, sitting in my trailer not knowing what to do. And so getting in was great. And so that was just, like, four days on a set. This was Mm. a couple of months. And so once you're there for a couple of months, the crew and everybody, you can ask dumb questions. And and I I had a lot of help from, from Alan Rickman and Morgan Freeman. They both were really nice to me, and I think they're theater guys. I'm a theater actor. You know, that's where I started. Uh, Greg Proops and I went to college together, both in the theater department, and we were both, you know, Greg was always doing stand-up, but he was a good actor, too, Mm. good enough to run around naked on a stage in Equus. I wouldn't have the balls to do that, (laughs) and he literally had the balls to do that. And um, and, Was he the horse? Of course. Yeah, they go with the horse. Yeah, blame the horse. He was great. I mean, you know, you guys would listen to his British, our British dialects there. We thought we were pulling him off and going, I can't imagine Greg doing a British accent, really. I don't, I don't he know. just did a real snarky estuary, you know, sort of like, you know, Guy Ritchie esque. It was just punky. Okay. So it was all in the front, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. A bit a lot yeah. of that. And, um, but he was great at it. Acting wise, it was great. I mean, as far as his commitment to it. Anyway, so I was all, you know, it was great to be on the set. And Alan was really nice to me. And Morgan was really nice to me. And uh, we tried to do a bit in the chasing at the end. In the, we're running around with the sheriff of Nottingham and Friar Tucker in the same castle. Where he did like the door thing. We opened it up. Nobody's there. Open it up, nobody's there. Open it up the third time, he's there. Like, ah! You know. And we, did, yeah. we really, and we did like three takes, and the crew was cracking up. But I think Reynolds was, no, that's too, you know, he. That's too much? <laughs> yeah, that's too, exactly. You know, he had Ruby Wax right, writing his comedy lines, Alan did, wow. you know. And um, so it's just thrilling to be, to see a very completely built Hollywood set. I was on Shepherd of the States, was the British thing too. That's where all the Hitchcocks, you know, were shot. Um, yeah, it's just thrilling all the way around to ask questions and, and have them answered, to learn how to do a master shot and break it down into a medium close up, extreme close up. Al, um, Morgan had to do one of those. And he actually knocked on my train. He goes, You want to come and see how to do these? Because you'll probably mm-hmm. have to do them every once in a while. I went, Oh, okay, cool. So he, I walked down with him and so you do it like that, 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 and I was like, you know, and he was like, well, there's a selfish reason you do it. You match all your body movement to the size of the shot. Then the editor gets in the room and he goes, oh, he connects everything. And usually that means you're in the movie more. And I was oh, like, oh, okay. There's there's an extreme, you know, I, I'm no fan of Ayn Rand, but the idea that, but a certain amount of selfishness that it motivates any sort of like behavior going, my, he's a very giving and a, you know, an ensemble player. Well, yeah, why would you want to go see a bunch of people being irritated by some douchebag on the stage who's being a star? There's musicals that could do that. I mean, there's famous actors who won't be named who are just dicks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, you know, you, and you get on the set going, 
after a month going, God, I, I hate this man. I, I used to <laughs> love him when I was a kid. What's he fucking doing, you know? And I've had one or two of those, but 98% have been great. You know? At the time, I, I knew one of the merry men. He was one of my neighbors. I was a kid when, when that came yeah. out. Um, uh, Lou, well, we knew him as Lou, uh, Howard Lou Lewis. Um, he's just... Good guy. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he did a lot... He chose for one, two, three. He... With hat trick? Is that... I'm not sure, actually. It's about the Roman invasion of Britain. He's like one of the Celts. Oh, it might be. We we'll look it up. We we'll look it up. He was Go in Maid Marian and Her Merry Men, and because okay. that, that was a kids show, so I saw him a lot in that. And then I'd go knock yeah. in his door and say hello. Um, and he 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 was in a, a few a lot of British things. Oh yeah, loads. Um, yeah. like a character. Well, sort of big, part. gentle, playing big, gentle, sort of clueless yes. dudes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And he was yeah. a lovely man, like, and he, was. he was all, he had a lot of time for me and my brother. Just would just knock and say hello, and then he'd just show us things he was doing. He like he did a lot of technology type computer things in his house. Um, but yeah, he, and so that was great spotting him in that. And like, there's Lou, and that takes you out of it <laughs> <laughs> when you see your neighbour there. <laughs> hey, you know, I was on the set. There's Jack Wild, who who was on yes. HR Puff and stuff when I was a kid. You know. And he was sweet. He was a sweet guy and really nice. And I was just so like, it's the Artful Dodger, you know? <laughs> he did, yeah. If you look up Chelmsford 1, 2, 3, he's one of the Celts in it. But he does, yeah, like you say, he was in another Robin Hood, May Marion or Mary Marion. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and so the joke yeah. was, this guy's covering all the Sherwood territory. Yeah. I think, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you're the same give him s- you, need, you need your big forest dweller. There we go, there's Lou. Yeah, you need he's a country there. guy going, Whoa. He's already there. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, and that's not slamming him. That's you know what the job is. It's like, you know, George Lucas says he goes. It's like hiring a plumber. You got something that needs to be repaired. You bring this guy in for this, and first you go. Well, I'm an artist. I achieved the widest tapestry of the human experience. Every time we go, oh no, no, it's a check. Oh, that looks good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you back off that shit. You know, you yeah. do the thing as well as you can that you're supposed to do, and yeah. you try not to do more. But when you're eager and you're young, you know, what is it? Oh. Is it, famous uh, like 40s film you know this director goes director has to stand in for an actor he goes up until today i've been your director but today i'm just like you an eager young ham looking to make good actors <laughs> let's go and he leaves the frame the other actor's like what the fuck was that <laughs> yeah, and, the show, and then the show flops you know yeah, of course and, uh well we're here really to talk about your week that's the whole premise of this flimsy little podcast oh well so we are breaking it down day by day mike monday what was that like what happened monday was really good i had a long session i have um i have uh lacrimose therapy uh Mm. part of my health program is i bathe in the tears of disappointed liberals in hollywood and believe me there's a lot of them right now i mean you know once you get the saline out you can actually drink it but i don't do that um but I use that, and I softens my skin. It helps me prepare um, uh, for my day. Uh, I have pureed fruit juices. Mm. Um, I don't use electricity for that. It's assorted rocks, which um, I attach to an epileptic squirrel. And uh, okay, when yeah. he's done with that, it's nice and smooth and very tasty. They really get it in, don't they? they really, yeah, they really do it. They do, they, and they need work. You know, mm. we have a lot of unemployed rodents in Hollywood. You would, you would probably imagine. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, if I can get a squirrel occasionally to do some work, we don't have any rats here. It's not really a city. You know, the old when I lived in London, it was great to get some rodents becoming bodyguards and running security for me out of East Cheap. Mm. And um, but here, it's like, yeah, no. So I get, and I'm doing some cleaning. We're moving stuff. I'm actually, truly, I'm giving stuff away. Um, uh, because we moved from one place to another and we're going through our clothing. So I've given a bunch of clothing to a shelter, uh, a lot of early clothing when I weighed a lot, um, you know, um, goes out, uh, a lot of stuff because I put on weight since COVID. Mm. I decided you're not going to fit into that again, dude. No. Just, no. dude, just get rid of it. No. Okay. And, um, so thank you for the some people going, my mildly tasteless late nineties clothing. It's it's for me. <laughs> you know? I have a hard time giving up um certain things like CDs. We're going through CDs right now. Yeah. And my wife and I are like, 
it's like dividing up uh, it's like dividing up a country without going into any modern detail. Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult, yes, and it we we each staunch our case. And Karen has good, solid of her generation, you know, taste in in music. Billy Joel, Seal, things mm-hmm. like that. She loves a lot of really good stuff. I have things like Eugene Chadbourne and recordings of the last Castrati singing to Pope Leo. I. Wow. I love weird music. I grew up in Kansas City, yeah. which is a suburb in the middle of Kansas, in, in a very ordinary, you know, people go Midwestern childhood, except my best friend, Joey Menina, we had a absolute fascination with Pink Floyd, mm-hmm. the Cambridge sound mm-hmm. from the 60s and the 70s, Soft Machine, um, Oh gosh, um, the names are failing me. Um, have you ever been to oh, a band from Halifax? Bizarre stuff, yeah. and I've always kept. I've loved it. I was just love weird, like Frank Zappa and things like that. Ever Cutler, who was a Scottish guy who did these weird monologues. It was just this. It was a look into another world and absurdity. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I was very attached to absurdity. I grew up nursed on Monty Python and Marty Feldman. Yeah. Uh, um, and the mid the West has an absurdity too. The Midwest has a certain sort of almost like um, Northern, like no face concept of things sometimes mm. of like, you know, well, how do I get here? Well, you just want to go another five miles and there's a rock and you turn right there. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> okay. You want some jarred corn? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> God be with you. <laughs> you know, that that's from my family's from northern Kansas. They're all like they're from Britain originally. My mom's I'm adopted, but my mom was a tiny woman. She's from family's from Sheffield, the okay. leadings. Yeah. Yeah, from Sheffield. Which is a great town, by the way, and is actually the great, great book and, and music stores. Uh I went there in like the ninety in late eighties when it was really rough. I stayed at a hotel called the Royal Lancashire, mm. and it was the most frightening hotel I'd ever been in. <laughs> and I, and I'd gotten a bag of pot, and I'd smoked too much dope during, and it was in a thunderstorm, and I was so high, and I was reading a book about Fred Rosemary West, oh, and I thought wow. I'm going to jump out a window if I don't get to sleep. <laughs> Very different to staring at a, ho- a cow. Um, mushrooms, isn't it? That's very different. <laughs> you gotta go for the f- yeah, exactly. Come to Sheffield, read about Rosemary Rest, get ready, paranoid. You'll love it. <laughs> it was fast, you know. It was like I was going, Why did I do that, man? Why did I do that? You know, what was what's everybody's like, I love that you know, whole drive, like, Sheffield's a lovely place, and then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and don't get wrong. And then I went back and they'd redone the hotel because it was this modern. They had to. They had to, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were. Turn it upside they down. Up and, they it. and they did not appreciate that. You know, they should have given me a check out before the demolition. He was searching for the bodies. They weren't there, Mike. <laughs> he was searching for the bodies. Come on. <laughs> but uh, so this week I've been just getting ready for that. I've been uh, trying to get, get some exercise in. I put on a lot of COVID weight. And I don't want to, like, you know, get on stage and I'm not able to move. No. So I'm surrounded by a nine-hole chip and putt golf course. I live in a place called Horace Heights Estates. And Horace Heights was a band leader from the late the late age of the big band era. And during the winter months, because he toured Florida and New York and all that kind of stuff, Florida was too expensive. And Vegas was too expensive. So out here in the valley, uh, in a place called Encino in Van Nuys, it was still open, and it was a. It was a, basically it was a horse ranch, and he started building, a bungalows on it, and they started building apartments, and over the course of time, it's had so it's, uh, people like, uh, you know, big band area musicians, uh, cinematographers. We have an Academy Award winning actress June Squibb. Um, you, she was in a couple of uh, recent films, Paul Thomas Anderson film, Academy Award winning actress. She's like ninety. And you see her walking around with her walker. It's a very interesting coterie of people. People who are in the business who are editors or color correctors, and they don't do those jobs anymore in the manual sense. It's all digital. So these guys retired, got their union check, and live in various apartments and play golf. I don't play that much golf, but I do have a I do have a putting green area right outside my window here. So every once in a while I'll get out and I have like a putter, like is, is that where you do meth? 
and then watch some <laughs> some golf. Well, yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We like to do it like we call it like we call it like a nine nine round fentanyl course, you know, <laughs> a little meth, a little fentanyl. The whole you come up, moving. you come down, you know. <laughs> Actually, one of the cats we have a semi feral cat I call Johnny Ringtail. And he uses the eleventh hole as a toilet, and it's really been, it's been quite a controversy. And he's he's a big tom with a big ring tail, oh. and he's got massive, you know, big T, BTE, big tom energy. Yeah. And so he comes, and he's like pinching a loaf right as you're coming up on the green, looking at you like, "That's right, man. That's what I'm doing. Work around it. Bring a dog out; he'll eat it. Be fine. Wow. How's that? You know? Yeah. It's like it's like having Sean Penn as a cat." <laughs> you know. He's just, out here, you know. He's been banned from a lot of golf courses. Yeah. It's, it's female cats. Yeah, he's been banned from the golf courses. Exactly. He's like, like let Sean like Penn a cat and a little golf and a little golf cart going. What's he doing out here? You know what he's going to do out here. <laughs> just don't make eye contact. Sean, Why? Sean. Just shit in your bag. <laughs> Shanghai surprise. That's what he calls it. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, so the um, did you manage to divide the CD? The thing about CDs is we've got a load of CDs, but we realised very recently we haven't actually got anything to play them on anymore. Oh, oh yeah. It, which is weird. Well, I, I have a little portable drive. Mm. I have a portable drive I travel with. And then what we're doing was we're upgrading our system. We're getting an, a, uh, an amplifier and they're getting a CD player to go with it, a mid-level one. So we can play them because we have LPs too. I have a turntable, um, but we have to go through those albums and see if they're even playable anymore. Yeah. I stored a bunch of them, my early jazz stuff from the seventies, and uh, you know, so it's it's an experiment. It's my parents were both born in the early part of the twentieth century. My dad was born in nineteen ten, and they're Depression era people. And the great thing is they didn't throw anything away, but we found some really cool stuff. But nowadays, all the stuff you know. I, I don't have kids. I have like a nephew who's like, he's a lawyer now and he's got a kid. And I go, well, they want this early like heart album. No, they won't. <laughs> they won't want that. They won't want an album. They can get that online. You know, yeah. what about this Grateful Dead t shirt? No, Mike, no. <laughs> you know, maybe somebody here will want that, but no. They, and he looks at me so lovingly, like, like, you know, we have a really close relationship. He's like, I don't want any of your stuff, dude. You can get rid of it. <laughs> I'm like, but it's it's worth nothing. Yeah. It's worth nothing. And you're like, I don't want it either. Please, someone take it. I don't want it either. Yeah. I have some T-shirts. Karen's like, why do you wear those? Even around the house. If you answer the door, people start giving you charity because you'll look like a homeless old man. You know? It's, it's sad. I mean, it's weird because the, 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 I mean, we're saying about the CDs and we... We realised we had nothing to play it on when we got a CD. It was like, oh, we should really yeah. listen to this. It was, of, I think, it was of your grandfather, wasn't it? Singing. Oh yeah, my granddad was an <laughs> opera singer. So uh, there's this CD that someone in my family had burned, and I'm like, oh, I haven't heard, heard yeah. listened to it. Yeah, and then we realised none of the computers we had or laptops actually had a disc drive. Yeah, um, and nothing had a disc drive that we had. The, our Xbox wouldn't play it because it doesn't play CDs anymore. We had to borrow we were one. Just we, were, we were just baffled. We were like, well, what, what do we do? <laughs> How do we make this work? I figured, because I was going to, you know, I had to download certain things that were on CDs for the, some of the computer programs. I got this, like, you know, $30, $40 one. And it, if I don't use it for a while, it won't work for the first couple of passes i have to take it out replug it re-usb it two or three times so it's like it's like you know it's like an old character it's like alistair sims you have to slap it if you don't know, oh i'm playing it <laughs> you know <laughs> a befuddled cd player it's like come on you're like doing this to snap you hit the top of it you know go, it only know. works if you put a book on one quadrant of it uh, i remember a guy had a cd player it only worked if he put a book on one part of it Wow, because it, it weighed down the the the, the okay. device. Okay. Yeah, gave it some pressure. Wow, that's that's crazy. <laughs> it's sad. It is sad, but I guess it happens to us all. You know, we're all CDs. Yeah, mate. Don't we really? Didn't think about it. That's it. We've got to go for my grandma's CDs. Yeah, she's got a mix there. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So that'd be if you go through your grandma's CDs and you go, 
what is this anal astronaut volume oh, six? <laughs> and he's just going, what? You know, because when you come upon your parents or your grandparents' porn, it's always oh. my, ours was ours was easy. It was books and yeah. magazines was my dad's, and they were all soft. They're like Playboy and stuff. We went to a friend's house whose dad was an upstanding Catholic citizen, and we found gay porn. Wow. I found gay porn at my friend's place. He found out his father was gay. That it was that was. We didn't know what to do with that information. That's quite that's quite a <laughs> just, discovery, isn't it? Just, we sat in like we stood what we call silent Catholic homosexual panic. <laughs> it's sort of like a rich broth that you just like steam in for a while, you know, until you need to, as your guy, you just don't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> we see in the UK we're okay because we can just go <clears throat> um cup of tea. Yeah. And yeah. that'll be that's it. Yes. That's Repress it. it. That's it's press it. Uh, move on. <laughs> it is. It's the softest reset button I've ever encountered in a culture. Oh, yes. You know, it all that you're, you're sitting in the house has been burned down. The cats are, everything's gone. And you're like, come and take that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, and you go, okay, we're starting over again. Yeah, got it. Yeah, it solves everything. It mm. really does. It just, it's absolutely. Sandy fun. Toxic told me once that um, at the NHS, if somebody had a stroke, the two things, was one of them was like, can they make themselves a cup of tea? Mm. And if they can do that without burning themselves or turning the house down, you're like, you've gone up a step. Yes. <laughs> so a so man friend. can make a cup of tea. She yeah. has no arms and legs and she's blind. And she's like, you know, but yeah. she can make, get the bag with her in her teeth and she's good. Leave her alone for a week. Yes, they, st they still do the test. That's why so many people <laughs> can't get universal credit because they can still make themselves a cup of tea. So that way you're not getting <laughs> yeah. You're fine. Well, they can't afford fucking tea bags, but they can certainly... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Come on, come on, get it. Ah, that seven seconds, you're out. <laughs> Next. That's what we get for our government. That's what they do to us. Oh, oh. Now well, watch the order you do it as well to make sure. <laughs> yes, they do. Because if you put the milk in first, they might oh, be yeah. like, mm. yeah, you're out. Yeah, yeah. So, what is it for you guys? Is it milk in first or milk after? No. It's got to stew first. It's got to stew for a bit. Yeah, you yeah, got, you got to make the tea first, yeah, exactly. right? The tea yeah. has to strengthen, and and yeah, and, and I figured that was the science of it. Yeah, and you can misjudge the milk to begin with, and then end up with too milky. Yeah, or not enough. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend. He makes his wife's tea, and he calls it Nutter's Brew because she has yeah. like the scantest tea tea teaspoon of milk. Oh, and and then you pour the water in. And you put the tea bag in, and you count to 15 and pull it out. I don't know what it tastes like. It just looks weird to me. It looks like tea that somebody left behind immediately. It yeah. looks like it's already looks like cold tea. They went, no, fuck that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quite hardy, though. I leave the tea bag in. Yeah, Alex, Alex has him still in the mug. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. You squeeze it in your tongue. Yeah, well, I yeah, like that. Yeah, is that a treat at the end? Just, yeah. It starts as hunger. <laughs> so it's a mudshot at the end. Yeah, so just suck <laughs> on a tea bag. <laughs> it's like an, it's like an Andean worker, like a thing of cocaine in the pouch of your mouth, going. <laughs> yeah. He worked for twenty five hours and never complained. <laughs> right, so what we've mentioned, like four drugs now, <laughs> five. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting through the camera. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, we're sorry, through the camera. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like an overfed Hunter S. Thompson, basically. <laughs> <You know? laughs> My wife has always said she's gone. I'm amazed you're successful at this, memorizing <laughs> things. And because she knew me in the 70s and we went to junior college together. She was like, the shit you've done to yourself that you can even string two sentences together. So I'm like, <laughs> it's coming, honey. It's coming. You know, one day I'll full on bongheimers and I'll just yeah. be like staring at the wall going. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's why I asked you on now. Um... <laughs> Thank God. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for catching me while I was young and fresh. Yeah. So Tuesday, let's move on to Tuesday. You've done the uh, oh, Tuesday. Yes. You have the CDs and that. So Tuesday's child is full of cheese. Yeah, I think that's right. That's and right. Uh, that is um, Tuesday. I um, did some more cleaning, uh, worked on the CDs. Um, I ran into somebody uh, who lives near me who I had not seen, but did not know lived near me, who was a theater director and a producer from the 80s that oh. I knew, who was very important to me. He actually gave me a place to live in the theater for about about four months. I was homeless in San Francisco. Wow. Yeah, I got bounced out. I was a horrible roommate when I was younger. I did not didn't do laundry for a month and would like put on the same clothing and 
people mm-hmm. are like, no, man, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, you can't. And then I met a, I met a girl who worked in the theater who smelled just as bad as me, and it was kismet for a while until then I outranked her, and she went, no, you've got to go. Birds are falling from the trees outside our house. And um, so this guy, put, he said, I'm going to need a place to stay. And he goes, well, if you do janitor work in the theater, you can stay here. So I was the janitor of the theater for, for four months, and it was a lot of fun. It kind of fulfilled that actory thing of like, of an actor who sleeps in the theater, who acts on the stage, who cleans the stage, yeah. you know. It's a bit Phantom of the Opera. Up, yeah. up there in the eaves, <laughs> looking down. It was a tiny theater, so I was a very oh. small phantom. You yeah. could hear me coming a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a nice kid. But I saw him, I was like, oh, my God, because we're masked. We didn't recognize each other. And he, and he said my name. I go, hi. Like, he knew me from something, you know. And he goes, it's Simon. And I went, that's nice. <laughs> 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 He was kind of like, I went, oh, my God. And he's like, oh, it's him, you know. But I, <laughs> wow. Because we, we walk around this place because it's four laps around the property is a mile or five mm-hmm. is a mile. And it's a way to get some exercise. And it's closed off and it's very quiet. You don't have to deal with a lot of people in the street. Cause it's, it's not really a gated community, but it's designed for the 40s, yeah, late 40s. And so it's naturally closed off. And uh, that's kind of makes it. It's one of its pluses to it. It's uh if you were in different neighborhoods in LA, you would actually pay a lot of money because, but it's just naturally built and built in from the forties with the trees and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's kind of, we're kind of happy here right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We were supposed to be in LA at the moment. We We had it. We had a holiday booked, um, but postponed because COVID stuff. Like when we postponed it was when it was still looking like a lot of, pre and post testing and things and we thought if we get stuck in America we can't afford to stay there if one of us has COVID and um, yeah so we ended up just we're delaying we will be there but I'm not sure when yet do you still have your tickets on hold or do you just refund them yeah pretty yes. much pretty yeah, much we do. yeah cool. BA have our money um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> <'Cause> I, I, <laughs> went, yeah. <laughs> I went to LA with work and it was such a quick visit we were, I think we were there for four nights and so and we had to arrive we went on the very first night that we arrived so I'd been awake for like I think by the end like over 24 hours I, I, I'd been awake for a very long time and was delirious at Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios so when you were like, <laughs> sleep deprived and just drinking to try and get yourself through the, the it, it it made for a really fun experience though. Well, it, the English the English solution, it's yeah, really worn out. Let's drink some more. Yeah, that'll wake me up. That works. But it, it's nothing wakes you up. It, it'll be people jumping in your face with chainsaws and things and screaming. So yeah. That. Did you punch anybody? No, but I am one of those people that in real life, if someone jumped at me, I probably would. Like if like the flight or fight thing. I would be a fight yeah. because yeah. I'm I'm a big person. I can't f- run away. My only thing is to take out someone's knees. <laughs> that, right. Dude, totally. That's where I'm at. I'm like, I'm now, you know, I was always big when I was bigger and I wasn't so big. Now I'm older. I can't run. I have artificial hips. I go, I'm gonna crush your instep. You know, mm. I um yeah. I learned that <laughs> from oh gosh, he's a British writer, British crime fiction writer. Oh, come to me. Um my name was Dor. My name was Doris Jeffrey Archer Suarez. It's Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> a criminal who writes. Yes, a criminal. I'm looking for a criminal who writes. Jeffrey Archer. I heard an awful thing about. I worked with a guy once. He did a. He was when he was a younger actor. He did a Jeffrey Archer play, and they went to the opening night at Jeffrey Archer's place, which I guess they always serve champagne and like shepherd's pie or something, because he's you know he's trying to play that. I'm posh, but I'm a man of the people. Yeah. And for the show, the actor had been dressed as an upper class guy, and they gave him a tailored jacket. And at the end of the run, he said, "Yeah, you could wear it. You know, you can keep it if you want." And we're actors. He goes, "It fits. It's nice, nice." But yeah, thank you. And he showed up to the party at Jeffrey Archer's show. He goes, "That's much too nice of a, j- a jacket for a jobbing actor. What oh. are you doing with it?" Oh. I was like, "Wow, really?" He was like, this friend's a really, he's a nice guy. And I was like, man. So he's one of those guys that can't let it alone. Yeah. He can't let it alone. I go, man. And then I saw what happened to him. I'm like, good for him. 
Yeah. Has to have a little. Well, I you you nicked some shoes, didn't? We're well, not nicked. Like you had costume shoes, and you. I had costume shoes. They I ended up them. becoming your shoes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were they comfortable? <laughs> yeah, they got a few years out of them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the army. You know, it's like the army. It's like they feed you, they give you shoes, and they tell you to do stupid things, yeah. and you do it for God and country. I went to Hyde Park Winter Wonderland as well, and I got the shoes from them as well. No, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. I was an actor shoes. there. Yeah, I got the shoes from that. <laughs> wardrobe. Well, see, that's why you don't do historical dramas because who wants to show up in like you know a tabard? <laughs> <laughs> no, these were very, yeah. very good thermal sort of um, you know the outdoor type of shoe. You know, they're the really, really right. comfortable ones. Uh, but I was dressed as a uh, huntsman. So the shoes didn't really work, but you know, I thought, you know, might as well have them, wouldn't I? Yeah, I, I always got like bit parts as um like fishwives. So if I wanted <laughs> to have a really unflattering blouse or shawl or yeah, big brown apron. Yeah. <laughs> big yeah. stained apron. Yep. Sorted for those. Oh my god. <laughs> Don't you love casting? Oh. Don't you love casting? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I auditioned for I auditioned for um something once as a Vietnam thing and I was I'd lost a bunch of weight. And they said, I don't believe you're a vet or a soldier. And I, and I looked at him, I go, What does a soldier look like to you? I'm a Vietnam vet. <laughs> Man. <laughs> it was like it was one of those things. Oh, people yeah. have their conceptions. Mm, I yeah. did I did one floor of the Cuckoo's Nest years ago. I toured it in the UK, oh, playing okay. Chief Bromden mm. with Danny Webb and Isla Blair. Right. And this critic came and saw the show, and amongst all these other things, I'm adopted. And I am. I'm half. My mother was Ojibwe, Chippewa, oh. um, from Northern Canada. And my dad obviously was a white guy. But, uh, this guy saw the show and he did, he hated me. And he goes, he looks like Haystack Calhoun. And he was like being really derogatory and nothing like the great noble savage of the American. And I'm like, wow. oh my God, you wow. noble savage. Go, and I was like, oh, this dude is still living in the, you know, 19th yeah. century. You get an image in your head of what it should be. <laughs> That's what it will be. Wow! And somebody big. show up like with the big aquiline nose and dark brown, and sort of like we have come here to have your <laughs> electroshock therapy, Kimasop. You know, like fuck you, dude. Even <laughs> that character in the book, he was, if I remember, because I've I've only read the book once, but he, part oh. of his dilemma was his roots and not feeling so attached to them, and his father or something. Like I can't remember that mm. there was a lot of personal conflict with him being westernized if that makes not westernized assimilated yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know it is it's a pretty manichaean book the the story is pretty you know agile property and yes and he's he's also a, a northern pacific, a pacific northwest uh you know ojibwe or or one of the fishing tribes and those are big guys aleutian indians alaskan native americans they're Big, wide-built people, mm. you know. I mean, I'm perfect. I was raised by Irish American and English American people. My mom weighed 99 to 100 pounds. My dad was 120. Small, dapper mm. Irish American. I'm six foot two, and I was, you know, pretty apparent right off the bat. They both had blue eyes, like brown eyes. You know, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was couldn't have been more different. And yeah. I just, you know, when I finally saw. Somebody who looked like me, yeah, it was a, there was somebody with wide back, wide hipped, you know, um, soft shouldered. I mean, my jaw. I had my I've had dental work done, and they did like a sort of a three D of my jawline to look at the work, mm. and they were rotating it around. I go, good lord, I have a jaw like like a nineteenth century trained cow catcher, <laughs> big. <laughs> Big wow. square edge thing, and I'm like, like if you found that in a pit, you know, you'd go, ah, this man must have chewed his way to freedom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not like the noble savage thing. <laughs> no, noble savage, noble savage. Yeah, he used that word, those two words. I was like, oh like baby, that. you know, yeah. I suppose you know, the deepest, darkest Africa is next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're the second guest we've had on that's been in um, one floor of the cuckoo's nest. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we had Lucy Porter on as well, and um, she was in the uh, Christian Slater one. In right, yeah, and 
Was she one of the nurses or was she one of the gals who came in? I think she was one of the gals that came in. If I remember correctly. Yeah, there's two gals that are good time gals that come yeah, in. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think she was one of those. Oh, she would have been hilarious in that. Yeah, and she had some really, really funny stories about Christian Slater as well. <laughs> so. He's a nice kid. Yeah. He's, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he had, when we first did the show, when we did Robin Hood, the first scene we actually did, we filmed was the after the, the Celts attack and were burying everybody. Mm -hmm. And he had to do that emotional scene with Costner. And yeah, and it wasn't happening. The writing wasn't real. It didn't roll you, you know. And he just had trouble getting it up for it. And Kevin's a film actor. He doesn't immediately give a lot. He's not. Yeah. I don't know if he's selfish or what, but he's not. Doesn't he gets there? He's on the other side of the camera acting with you, but it's just there, kind of. Mm -hmm. Christian wasn't getting ramped up, and Kevin went here. Let me show you how to act this scene, and we all went, oh, oh, oh. oh. And we stop down. Oh. It's kind of fun to know it happens on that level, though. Like, yeah. it's not just Amdram. <laughs> yeah. I had someone berate me and give me my line because I was doing a dramatic pause. Oh, really? Yeah, I remember that happened once. I was like, Oi. I know what it is. <laughs> I just, I just had to say to I know what it is. Man. Oh. Yeah, that was, it was only awkward because you could have, like, let's stop cut let's work the scene out let's just talk the scene out because yeah. that's cool that you know that's that's right on the money yeah yeah, yeah. you know um that's it. unless you're really really old school i did i did a, a tv film with sir john gilgood and he oh. we did not talk about the scene yeah. he would refer to the director and ask the director and then he would go so what did you think you know but i was like it was kind of it was the first time i ever worked obviously somebody that great and somebody was of that Year of school, the sort of the, you wore a tie and a shirt to rehearsal sort of guy, you know, mm. and um, chain smoking cigarettes. And, uh, yeah. And he was almost 90 then. He was chain smoking these, uh, like, Balkan Sobrani, really dark tobacco. Yeah. And he was the only one who was allowed to smoke during the rehearsal. We were at Acton, in North Acton, and, uh, you know, I have all these other actors, big names, Rosemary Harris, all these other people. And, you know, he's over there smoking in the corner with his, like, you know, it's like this this egg yellow, really beautiful mohair sweater with big burn holes in it from the cigarettes. <laughs> Holding his cane, I went, "This guy's great," you know. But still, I go, "Yeah, of course he's good. He can smoke. He can smoke wherever. In fact, he can be naked out on the balcony." And I go, "Hello, Sir John." He's yeah. the only one who can piss himself on set. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like somebody to stub a cigarette out on my naked chest. <laughs> <laughs> He's old school, it's fine. He's <laughs> old school. I need motivation. <laughs> Burn me. Wow. <laughs> That's James Mason. James Mason. James Mason, yeah, he was like he was a humiliation freak, man. You know, <laughs> I love that shit. <laughs> um, so... Welcome to Mike McShane's Hidden Hollywood. Yes. So Tuesday was... Running into <laughs> yeah, we got into Tuesday. <laughs> this is a long way. What, what? We keep asking you sorry, So Wednesday, oh. Wednesday, I slept. Good. I have a hyperbaric chamber, which was used to be used at Neverland. I don't quite fit in it because of Michael Jackson size, but if I curl up, I can get most everything done. Okay, and after that, um, I uh, I made a delicious meal, mm -hmm. um, a Moroccan chicken dish, which nice. we're still noshing on. Um, it's Moroccan chicken's fantastic. It's getting the chicken to take the fez off as it goes into the oven, which is very <laughs> difficult. You know, most of the chickens I get from Tommy Cooper Farms, and they clean them just like that, just like that. <laughs> and, um, oh, that's good. <laughs> I had to get that in there. I'm sorry. That's very good. That's very he seems, you know, he's one of those things. It's like, um, as a, if he was an American funny person and you work in the UK, if you don't get through that checkpoint, if somebody shows that to you, like Paul Merton showed me that Tommy Cooper the first time, and, and me and Proofs were like, what the fuck? We started yeah. laughing. He goes, good. Because he goes, <laughs> if you didn't get that, we may be asking you to leave. Yes. Yeah. But I, I mean, you, I, we did we did embrace you, you know, Greg Proofs, Colin Mockery, Ryan Stiles with the whole Who's Lines It Anyway team. Colin doesn't count. He's Canadian. He's a dick. Well, I know. Um, yeah, we still, he, 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 can, he can stay where he is. 
Um, <laughs> the sexual taste, too. I've yeah. never seen a man do that with an elk. That's Canadians. <laughs> Oh, bless him. I love Colin. Um, but it's, I, I mean, there's no, you really did. Did you find you have to adjust your humor um, at all for us? I, you know, Greg and I actually did talk about that because we both are from San Francisco. We came, we actually did go to college together. And we think we might have fit well because we're at that point, we're still San Francisco performers. Mm. And, and we're, which is different from New York. Like San Francisco is more like a Manchester or Bristol. Okay. It's a little, you're never going to get famous there. You're going to have to leave to get something, yeah. but the quality of the talent there is amazing. You had Robin Williams. You, uh, I worked at a theater company where the first, uh, table readings of angels in America, Tony Kushner worked there. Mm. Annette Benning. We used to do Shakespeare in the park. It was just, you had to leave to go elsewhere, but there it was easy going. The work was cool. It was you did any kind of work. You never felt like you know I'm a theater actor or I'm a film actor. I was there and he got into it. Yeah, yeah. And Greg and I were raised on. When I was a kid, I watched the the Marty Feldman Comedy Machine. When I was about eleven or twelve, it was on public television, mm-hmm. and that at opening credits were Terry Gilliam as the animated Terry Gilliam bit, yeah. and I remembered. The guy goes to the veterinarian with the animal in the cage with the smoke and the claws coming out. I remember that. And the one was a purported anthropological look at, at kings and queens done as a nature program where it was like fast motion. And he had the, had the crown like hanging on his nose and he was flapping his robes <laughs> like a know. bird and shit. And I was just on the floor because it was just insane. It was, it was the absurdness of it. Yeah. Yeah. We, I just it tickled me. I mean, I was raised a uh, very strict American Irish Catholic, and so the sort of the Irish notes of absurdity, which Irish culture has, combined with you know sitting with a talking to a priest or a nun who you're going, this is crazy shit, <laughs> but I'm going to go with it, you know. And anyway, so we I think we worked into our system, and we we liked that stuff. And Paul Burton was actually, frankly, Paul and Richard. <clears throat> kind of took me and Greg under our, their wing in the beginning. Mm, mm. And uh, so Paul and we'd all talk comedy. Yeah. Paul's, you know, Paul and Greg had these massive, massive abilities to process information and to get it out like that. They're, yeah. um, they're um, what is it? They're autodidacts. Yeah. Self-taught. Um, their verbal skills are always highly acute. They they remind me more of each other than not in many ways. Mm. But then the, there's a separation. But he was just helpful. Paul liked comedy. If he liked to laugh, and he'd show you stuff. So like little titch and sort of uh, variety. Because Greg and I liked vaudeville. We loved American vaudeville, which is their version of variety. But it stopped. Yours never stopped. No. Mm. It carried it carried its heroes into film and television. Yeah. You know. I mean, you have an amazing history. The um, Jimmy, who was on the little guy who would get his head whacked by Benny Hill. Yeah, he's, yeah. I can picture him, but yeah, I can't remember his name. Yeah. Okay, Jimmy was one of the last performing members of the Fred Carno vaudeville troupe. Oh, and really? so when Charlie Chaplin left to go to Hollywood, he taught his understudy, who was Stan Laurel. Stan Laurel continued with the tour with the Carno troupe until he saw Hollywood, and he trained. His understudy, which was Jimmy. Wow. Jimmy trained Robert Downey Jr. to do the bit that you saw in the film Chaplin, where he's in the the drunk guy in the in the box seat, yeah. hanging on the box seat. And so there's this as if if comedy is a craft and an art, you know, it's like you step out here, you turn left. Look, take a couple of beats, come back here. Okay, get back on your foot. You're gonna do a tumble. You do you do a 108, which in vaudeville and and early silent film comedy is a 180 degree f- turn. Yeah. Keaton, when Keaton does the complete from standing still on his oh, back. Yeah. And he didn't. And that's the thing. There, it was 180 degrees. Well, 108. You know, they're not educated. They're not. <laughs> they're not like guys going. Oh, really? No, no. I think that, you know, they were just. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. Boom. Yeah. How many times can I do this in a day? How much am I getting? You know, Amazing. Ben Turpin, who's a cross-eyed guy in silent films, oh, when yes. they're setting up shots, he would get a silver dollar. He goes, I'll do a 108 if you give me a silver dollar. Just trying to make extra money. So he'd sit there and flip himself like eight or nine times. Then he'd get to the shot and he's beat to shit. 
Wow. <laughs> Matt Sennett, who's like produced all the great comedies, come out going, nobody gives him a silver dollar again. If you give him a silver dollar, I'm going to fucking fire you. <laughs> That's my horse. That's my horse. He runs for me, you know? And uh, um, I think that's the practice. I never had the guts to be a stand-up comedian in my in my time. Mm-hmm. That's why, I'm, you know, I'm always pressed with Paul and Greg and David yeah. Badil. God, he can name a bunch of them. Yeah. I, you know, but I like the lineage. Mm-hmm. Theater can get a little too... Yes. Sometimes comedy is like... And thank you to your culture, because when I came to Hollywood, they said, you know, hey, you got to get rid of this birthmark. I go, it's called makeup. You can cover that. Or you mm. need to lose weight. You're this or you're that. Now they pat themselves on the back. If there's a plus size woman, they go, we really embrace it. I go, you didn't embrace shit. Yes. For like, yes. I said, time immemorial. She's yeah. a big girl. She's a clown. She's a big girl. Yeah. She's this. Right. You know? The comic relief or like the gross joke or something like that. And... Ding. It's two degree guys got the same thing uh, if you're a big guy. But in Britain, I came over and basically was like, well, you make us laugh. Come on in. <laughs> and you're like, I say, we don't care. <laughs> That's what we want, you know? That's what you want. That's why you got Johnny Vegas. That's why you got Matt Lucas. That's exactly brilliant right. comedic artists. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> because also, you're not picky. <laughs> no, exactly. We're not. We're not. We just big we're... women too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Don French. And, yeah, yeah. Got Don. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, it's, I mean, it is and Don when... French is beautiful as well. She is. She's stunning. gorgeous, man. Absolutely. She's stunning. Elizabeth Taylor, beautiful man. Yeah, look at her in Vicar of Dibley. Um, back in the day, my goodness. Oh, Carolyn Quentin. Oh yeah, yes. Carolyn yes. Quentin. Yes. She was she was bigger when I first knew her, and she, but I remember one day she was like, we we're at some party. She was married to. Paul then she was like, No, before she married to Paul, there was like a comedy store tour. And we were hanging out and she was like, I was drunk and she was drunk. I went, God, you are gorgeous. <laughs> she was like lying on the couch, like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> large, large, large drunk women. I'm a I'm catnip for me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> They're too exactly drunk to run. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. No, she's um I've I've been following her on Instagram actually at the moment. She's doing some sort of Gardening or something or other. I haven't really got into it. I've just noticed it. Was... Girl, like Sandy Toxic teaching you how to bake. What the hell is that about? Oh, <laughs> oh I love Sandy Toxic. We too. love Sandy. I do too. But like, I was on sweet she is. She's really got emotional and she had to say goodbye to people. She's actually, she's kind of a softie inside. Yeah. She doesn't like, she doesn't, she, she didn't ever like the play of it. I mean, I mean, you see some of the, um, on YouTube, there's like the, uh, bef- on, on the QI recordings, they, they have like compilations of the stuff before that. Before they record, mm-hmm. and she just seems so sweet and so and has to hug everyone who comes on and just you yeah, know, you're just like I want to hug off Sandy Toxic. I want her to adopt <laughs> me. I, I'd like, I'd I'd love to just go to hers for Christmas and things. You know, yeah. like yeah. just come look after me, please. I'm having a bad day. <laughs> She'd be so good at that. She would. Oh, so Wednesday was. I've forgotten. <laughs> Wednesday, See, well, we had it. We had a lovely uh, uh, Moroccan chicken meal the fe- and the chicken, the fez. That's what the, fez. the yes. fez, exactly. Um, oh, and, um, and then uh, we, I'd had a a very fitful sleep that night. I've been having a lot of uh, dreams about doing the tour and mm. you know that kind of stuff. The actor dream where you're going, where what theater I'm supposed to be at? Yeah, I mean the show's on that kind of thing. Yeah, I've had a lot of that. I remember I had one dream where the the players. Or not the players, the chums were in some weird European town, and I was trying to find out where they're staying. And everybody except Richard Vranch was in this little like German cafe, you know, eating schnitzel. And Richard was standing outside looking at the schnitzel. And I'm like, going, "Go inside, have the schnitzel." They go, "They won't <laughs> let me." I go, "Why won't they let you have the schnitzel?" <laughs> and I looked at them, and they're looking like. You know, what is he, is Schnitzel Coventry right now? Nobody <laughs> talks about him not getting the schnitzel. schnitzel. What the hell is with you people? <laughs> and I was really upset at Paul and Suki and Lee. And, 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 you know, and then I was like, i got to stop having these dreams, man. You know, someday I'm going to be rocked on the tour bus. You what? know going to happen now, and you're going to be living that dream. And you'll be like, oh, no, 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 what, what's what's going on? And then... Everyone's eating schnitzel yeah, except for Richard. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Like- yeah. <laughs> There's like a Viennese, not Viennese, or Viennese, like a uh, little deli in London by one of these theaters. And I know I'm going to go by there and they're going to be in there. And I'll see Richard walk up. I'll go, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just dragging like me in. I'm getting you your schnitzel. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the dead zone with schnitzel or something. I dreamed I saw. No, it didn't happen. No, it did. <laughs> oh, man. I touched the schnitzel and I saw man's inhumanity to man in a pageant tree. <laughs> like a torrent of lava. Yeah. Flooding through my mind. I mean, who would have thought it? it, would have, it would have <laughs> so that was, that was Thursday. That was Thursday. Thursday was the No, spirit. no, it was actually Wednesday. We oh, moved Thursday. to Thursday. Yeah, but he's going to Thursday. Thursday, yeah, tell Thursday I fast. Okay. Oh, okay. I drink nothing but water, mm-hmm. and um, and I stay away from people because I'm really pissed <laughs> off, man. I mean, <laughs> I'm yeah, I'm the giant hang. I'm the hanger of hangry. Yeah. They just like they open the doors and a large 1955 B 57 angry white man comes out and just <laughs> is on the tarmac bitching at everything. <laughs> Why isn't the world suited to my desires? You got the email. <laughs> Damn you. Do you. So do you fast from midnight to midnight? I do. I do. And then uh, I have a small biscuit, and then my wife allows me to come into bed with her. Because ah. usually then my blood sugar is just dropped enough that I'm not I'm not hugging my pillow and crying. And um, <laughs> You can have a biscuit and then come to bed. It's just so <laughs> Wow. Like a second runner up in a prom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, is that a recent thing you're doing or is that just something? Well, I'm just trying to keep my girlish figure. Okay. And I think that matters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just, uh, there's a lot of people who don't get to eat a lot in their lives. And uh, I figure what I don't eat, somebody else will enjoy. That's a good As point. I get older, I'm just going to try to do that, you know. Yeah. Sort of like a, one of those monks who just keeps eating poison really slowly until they cover them with plaster. And they're yeah. just like a sculpture somewhere. They crack open 300 years later and go, my God, there's <laughs> an only smiley, mildly successful American comedian inside this jar. <laughs> Desiccated completely. Let's grind his bones up for an aphrodisiac. Hmm, I feel funny. Yeah, it worked. Where do I know him from? Whose line? Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I thought I tasted something off. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I admire that, to be honest. I think it um, shows great willpower. Uh, that I'm not sure I can Listen, do it. you know, when I come, come and see me do some comedy, it'll ruin your appetite for a week, Alex. <laughs> I'm and on the I don't charge for that. Diet. I'm on the Mike McShane <laughs> diet. It comes with the show. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's the Lawrence Fox diet. God, I saw one hour of stand up I haven't eaten for a week. <laughs> oh, Lawrence Fox. Why'd you bring him up? <laughs> I, well, it's because, yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just saw it was one of those guys who went, Women aren't funny. He was one of the guys who did the old, I'm going to be controversial. And I go, Why do you even truck yeah. this out? Yeah. anymore it's just it's like there's a barn the horse comes out it's like bow backed skeleton is showing it falls <laughs> over and you put stick and you're going no you're not getting an audience for it anymore put the dead horse back in yeah. it's just it's yeah. it you know ooh, ooh. Oh, man. yes one half of the human race has mm-hmm. escaped the ability to be humorous just from that point alone i'm like really yeah. really yeah just to me, I just think, well, that just says he has no sense of humor, really. Yeah, I know, I know. oh, it's the weakest controversy. We live for the bites, yeah. you know, we live yeah. for the bites. Speaking of which, is Friday because I live in America and I'm a senior and uh, I get a discount at the American Outrage Buffet, where oh. it's, it's like a large serve yourself area with troughs of bile, okay. and the bile is just depending on what if it's like you know, gender. You go to that one, you get some of that. If it's race, you know, you, there's a whole white section for white guilt. Wow. And there's okay. a whole African-American section of like, just not good enough, which, yeah. you know, and, you know, you can't, we can't go over there and eat that, but they can come over and eat our guilt. And, you know, so it's very interesting. Oh, I'm full of white guilt. I, I gorge on I that. Can, 
Yeah, exactly. We have uh, we have a woke club where you're just insomniacs walking around apologizing for <laughs> weeks upon end. You know, often when I'm trying to save money, um, you know, I'm from the Midwest. We used to have a place called Slay and Save, where you can hunt down your own animals at a discount. And um, <laughs> it's usually it's like usually usually like supermarkets didn't do very well, and they just keep the shelves open and keep the aisles open, and they let the wild animals in, and you pick them off. You know. Just- but like, do you get to choose what with? Like, can you can you go for, for like a sling or? Yeah, go for a sling. You can go paleo. You can go for a yeah. sling or rock rock uh, in a net. Um, you can make your own spears. It's sort of like a corkage fee. They charge Very... you five bucks if you make your own spears um, to hunt them down. Um, I belong to the NRA. The mm-hmm. Nude Rifleman Association. Okay. We nice. just we hunt naked. Yep. We figure naked prey, naked hunter. Often for a lot of us, especially if they're domesticated animals like dogs and cats, just seeing a naked white man with a gun stuns them yeah. into obedience. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you use camouflage when you do that? Or is it just well, you know, it's kind of like my own personal camouflage, my birthday suit. They <laughs> just think, you know, wow, that's that's a really large oak tree with all the bark stripped <laughs> off. <laughs> It's coming towards us. It's coming towards I, us. It's a human there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like with a panel, a hole cut out. <laughs> Good Lord, look at that sycamore. Howdy. <laughs> My goodness. I uh, love that. On, on a tangent, Alex actually reminded me of something earlier, of um, s- something that I was gutted to miss, and it was, it was years ago, was when you was in Little Shop of Horrors. Mm. Yeah. As, Audrey too, uh, uh, that like it's one of my favorite shows, Little Shop of Horrors, and I, but again, I was I think I was quite young when that was, so I didn't have the funds to, to go to the theater, mm. but I would have loved to have seen that, but that what a fun it, part. It was a great part. It's such a, it's a great part. We had uh, Paul Keating with Seymour, and Sheridan Smith was Audrey, and she was magnificent. Mm. She got, as long as you watch, you know. Work with people early on in my life, you go, Oh, that person's probably gonna be like Annette Benning. You're like, it's probably gonna be a star. Yeah. And when she sang Somewhere That's Green the first mm-hmm. time, and the audience is weeping, she got so much variety out of that song. Played it, didn't play it for sympathy, but because of her voice and her timbre and whatever, it's just, you get done, you can see the audience just like, yeah. with her for the rest of it, you know, and yeah, it was, and, um, the two guys that ran the plant, uh, Andy Heath and Brian Herring, they did it, they alternated. Because you had to get inside the plant and thrash and do all this stuff. And Andy Heath is this big gay nature boy from the uh, like from the Jer- from Jersey. Nice. They built this plant, no no small expense. And the first movie literally ripped it off its mooring. But wow. because then it could really move, he was just <laughs> like, you know, it was great. He's a... Both were really good improvisers, so we could riff with each other because I was on a camera. Wow, okay. Watching him, and so if he would do a roll of the body, I'd go, uh, you know, I'd do all the moves to make it more lifelike. And they were both Jim Henson guys, so all those extra moves and shifts of body weight in the large plant gave it this really amazing life. And Brian is much smaller, and Andy was always big, sort of t shirt, black t shirt, black cargo pants. You know, and Brian was like Mission Impossible. He had like a wetsuit and a, a little <laughs> thing and goggles, and he was like they're completely different. And he's he's small. Brian's small, and he got in there it was like he's going down to like spelunking in a well. You know, he'd get in there and do it. And he was great, and uh, he was really good at making it laugh and chuckle. He could do something to make it vibrant in a way. Brian is now he runs uh, uh, in Star Wars. He's BB-8. Oh, nice. oh yeah. So okay. he and another guy does all the BB-8 stuff. It's now he's a rock star. It's wow. great. He's like a Star Wars rock star, uh, you know. Wow. And uh, and he's a he's a nerd of the first stripe. When I used to go visit him, go hang out, and 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 he had like everything in boxed condition: Han Solo, the first dolls, all the all the stuff. I mean. He's amazing. Now I think he's got it all like secured in a locker somewhere. <laughs> but his 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 and he was like it was all dusted and clean, you know. And I was like, wow, your commitment, sir. 
Yeah. Your commitment to your cases, sir. I applaud them. I see. Well, everything we get is unboxed. We don't. Yeah. We don't keep in. Same here. I didn't. You know. I didn't. You know. I have. You know. The Universal monsters. I have the Ravel Universal, uh, Phantom of the Opera, Wolfman. Mm. I had the original Aurora Godzilla when I was a kid. Nice. All of that. I mean, you know, I took the Godzilla with me to the army and stuck a joint in its mouth and <laughs> sitting in my closet. You know, that's <laughs> awful shit to these things. People are like, what are you doing, man? I, I was it's enjoying worse, them. It's when you don't know where they've ended up. I think about the some of the, the toys I had when I was younger, and I, I have absolutely no idea where they are. Yeah, I know my mom like distracted me with something else, knew that I had forgotten, and then just well, that's probably what gave them to, away. Yeah, that's probably what happened to me. And I was thinking I, the other day, oh, my like original. So for me, it would have been like My Little Ponies and stuff, and I think, mm. like they might have been yeah. worth something now. Oh. <laughs> my mom, yeah, we we donated. My my best friend since I've been five years old, and we're still friends, Tommy. Um, Tommy came from a huge family. I'm an only kid, but there was like 11 children. Wow. And so anytime I'd start to grow my clothing, because I did grow really quick from about five to like 15 for puberty, 13 for puberty, I would just every year, monthly. And so we'd give clothes away. And yeah. Tommy it would get close to because the family had this varying length of, of boys in it of different sizes. Mm-hmm. It made it really easy. And, and actually, that's how we became friends because I'd go and hang out with him. And... Is that still happening now? Is he still giving, being him... Your, giving him close now? <laughs> giving him your clothes. Actually, I did. <laughs> I, bought, I bought some shirts in Hawaii with some really crazy rock and roll stuff. He's from Kansas. He's a, he worked at GM. He worked on the line. He's a blue-collar guy. Mm. Very man of few words, uh, but not at all macho. He's like maybe 6'4", big-shouldered, was a swimmer in high school. Mm. And uh, literally, we would would call him up when I was a kid. I'd go, hey, how you doing? All right. We want to go do something? Yeah. What do you want to do? I don't know. You want to go ride bike? Yeah. Okay. Smoked a lot back then, yeah? (laughs) He did. He had a voice like this. He still does. He has a voice like this. He's like... um, (laughs) Was kind of Kansas, but he's just he was dyslexic, really, mm-hmm. really dyslexic. And people used to make fun of him and call him a retard and shit mm-hmm. like that. And we'd walk back home, we'd walk home together because we're on the same area. And he would tell me stuff and joke. And I'm arrogant enough because I'm very verbal to go, Well, he he makes me laugh, he must be intelligent, <laughs> you know, because he was he was really, it's the British you know what I'm thing. saying? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He could do a turn of phrase. But he couldn't read, you know, mm-hmm. and just we just hung out. So we would help each other out with stuff like that. Mm. And so we stayed friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's his that's dad was my godfather. My dad was his godfather, that uh, Catholic thing. You don't, you don't really, a good that's guy. really impressive since five years old. I'm not saying you're ancient, Mike, but it is quite a long time. That is a long time. Yeah. It's, it's 61 it. years. Wow. I turned to him in class one day and said, will you be my best friend? And he went, yeah. Because oh. <laughs> it's Tom Micah. So last name M I K A and my M C, we were right next to him. It's just stayed the same. Oh. I I just don't I, I don't know why. Did he know I that mean, that was a lifetime contract when he answered? Did I, I think he didn't. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't know the writing. He was like, <laughs> uh, I didn't know if I had to sign it. Oh blood. yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> just sign it. Yeah. Catholic, you know, we rubbed ashes on each other's head and yeah, you know, did the yeah. dance. I don't think. <laughs> Sometimes in your culture, it's like years when I first moved there, I, I was how I go say who it was. I met their grandmother, and she goes, "So where are you from? I'm from Kansas." Hey, that's very nice. So I go, oh, okay. I go, and I went to Catholic. She goes, "Oh, a papist." I went, <laughs> "Did you just say papist?" <laughs> are you gonna like hit me with a branding iron or something now? <laughs> Is there a dunking booth out back of your fucking house? You know what the hell? I think she was being wry, but I was still like, oh, God, it's still here, isn't it? All right, you know. Wow. That's... How about this? I'm bisexual. That erases everything. Isn't that great? We can do it now. <laughs> I'll give you something else. i give you something else. Right. Yeah, here you go. You really want to? You know, now you're confused. You don't know whether they hate me or love me. Which one cancels which? Which is worse? Yeah. I'll let you guys figure that out. <laughs> I'm dropping my trousers. What happens now? <laughs> so... You gotta see my ass tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I blow your Won't mind. You? <laughs> yeah. 
So we'll we'll move on to Saturday, I guess, the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, right. let's do. What was that? The Saturday of the weekend was um uh was spent with um rehearsing improvisation, which is always the lovely people go, Who oh, can you go? Because you work on a form and then you throw all the information away and see what sticks. Mm. And so I'm working with a friend of mine who's a improvising singer. Uh, we're doing a thing called the Great American Wrong Book, oh. <laughs> and it's um, an improvised cabaret act where we sing and narrate the life of a fictional composer. Nice. And we get the audience to phone in or text in titles, styles, and genres. Basically, it's showstopper on the cheap. Love it. Um, Love it. Because of of Adams and Dylan's and the company's success and having worked with them early on with mm-hmm. Ruth and Pippa and all and Adam. Yeah. I admire them so much. And some of their technique, I thought Brian and I, Brian Lohman, he actually taught me impro impro. He's the guy who brought when we first started brought Keith Johnstone's book in. And he's a really good singer. And uh I thought, well, let's get together because we had a good vibe together. Sort of a hope and crosby thing always had. Yeah. So we try to create these characters and we come in and get that. And so we're gonna try to take it to the UK next year. Oh, so amazing. we have a friend of ours who's got a he's learned to use a looping box and stuff to mm-hmm. lay in stuff. Yeah. And uh so we thought the three of us together will have fun. So we did that uh for a couple of hours and we like did nine songs in two hours. Wow. They're mostly shite. <laughs> but we're just pulling bits of it out that worked well. Yeah, or trying to make it a little quick to show people to listen yeah. to. So I did that. And then um let's see, we Karen and I went to a place to get some tamales mm-hmm. because we have I have a little California food before I leave for the UK. Of course. Um I'm I'm staying, I'm trying to bring I'm staying with a a, a comedian named Sally Hotchkiss. And mm-hmm. Sally's uh She's like, you can teach me American. You can cook me American foods. And I'm like going, oh, my God, what do you what do you mean by that? Because it's really huge. I go, if I can find masa, which is cornmeal, because yeah. I'm not going to make it by hand. You can make it by hand, but uh, it's really complicated. You have to use ashes or something, to alkali, to neutralize the corn and open up the niacin oh, wow. in order to make it mashable so you make things to make tortillas out of. Right. Or you can buy it in a bag. Mm. There's got to be someplace like a Colombian food store, or San Salvadoran, any any uh, any Central American uh, place will have that mm. in the UK now, which is great because yeah. uh, I love tamales. Yeah, I haven't They're ever had so, tamales. So it's a corn like a corn meal, and you make sort of a you put it on a corn husk, either dried or green. Right. Yep. Different different communities use different ones for different reasons. And you make like a paste out of it. And you sort of grab the paste, lay it out in a big smear, and then you put a filling, either a little meat, some cheese, yep. and then you wrap it up in the in the leaf mm-hmm. of the corn and steam mm-hmm. it. The steaming mm-hmm. process cooks the, the the meat or whatever's in the middle and mm-hmm. solidifies the, the the form of the tamale. Then you mm-hmm. peel it off. And you usually have a sauce you put on. You just eat it. And it's real. It's usually in, in California. It's usually for Christmas. People right. love tamales for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And you get up at like three in the morning, and get in line because some somebody's aunt, somebody's abuelita, makes the best tamales. And, and in order to bind together, they use a little pork fat, which makes it even more tasty. And, uh, you know, you get two tamales, some black beans, and some rice, a little sour cream, a little pico de gallo, pico de gallo, mm-hmm. I mean, on top. Wow. We haven't eaten, have we? <laughs> oh, <laughs> man, it's time to we breathe, man. Huh? <laughs> we just, we just, mm, mm-hmm. it was, as you were describing it, I was like, yeah, we, we haven't eaten. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, sorry, we, exactly. didn't, we, we didn't even register. We didn't even well, register. that got just appetites wetted. Get break out the old Faye bentos. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got to be like bung that in. I mean, hey, you know what? Beans. I when I go there, one of the first things I'll eat when I go come to your country is I'll get the Heinz beans, big thick slice of doorstop bread, grated cheddar. The more crystalline, the better. Yes. And slop that down, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is, 
big yeah. carbo load. They just sit, and then, then I watch. I go, let's see what the BBC has come up with this year. <laughs> All right. Oh, no. Yeah. What? You know. Yeah, well, BBC Three's back on TV, by the way. I don't know if you knew that went. But, uh... That's good. Because yeah, it got yeah, because there's a big protest about it, hmm. about pulling yeah. it. It's yeah. a good stuff. It's kind of like Channel mm-hmm. Four in the old days. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Speaking of which, yeah. I, earlier because I, once again I was doing my research on you, blah blah blah, because yeah. I like to do that. I mean, I know about you, obviously. I was a big fan of Who's Line, but uh, I came across uh, across even uh, an old clip of S and M that you did with Tony Slattery. Um, yes. And it was on YouTube, and it was the two peas in a pod. <laughs> and you both your heads against each other, and you were green. And yeah. That was a wonderful sketch. Followed by the testicles one, where you were both testicles. <laughs> yes. Is there testicles. We yeah. tried to, We got so much mileage out of that one. At that point, I think it was like the second day, and he and I were just, you know, we were both raised I'm American Irish Catholic. He was raised Irish Catholic. Yeah. And of course, there's things that happened to both of our lives because Catholicism were, and it was a way to kind of go. Yeah. So we were like, we were like altar boys who, who were like, is that the wine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was just delightful. He's a, he's a sweet man. He's, yeah. He's yeah, a sweet he man. Is. He's complicated, but he's yeah. a sweet man. Yes. And it was it was always a, a always fun to watch. You know, he was always fun to watch. He was yeah. just he never knew what he was going to do. Yeah. And when we did that show, Dan Patterson, who produced Who's Line, also produced that. And Dan would try to get in and shape it, basically not make it improv. And yeah. Tony would just go, "Get the fuck out of here, Dan! Go, go away!" <laughs> and he'd bring out a can of deodorant and spray Dan with deodorant <laughs> on the set to make him walk like a bug. It was, it was, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love the fact it was so fast and loose, and it was just, you know, if, if there was laughter between you two, you kept it in, and you know, it was just, it was refreshing. It was it was it was it was a lovely show. Oh, thank! I remember. Thank you. I remember doing the peas in the pod, and we were just there, and it was lull because we were breaking up. We were mm. like getting a divorce. I looked at him, and I just didn't know what to know what. If you see me walking down the, it's like Dion Warwick, and I go, he's a gay man. He's going to lose his mind. <laughs> if, I do, if I'm like centimeters from his face, seriously singing "Walk On By," I know yeah. I got him. I got him, <laughs> you know, and I did. I got him going, and I, then I started because then we're like two children, right? You're like, I made yeah. my friend laugh. I'm happy I made my friend laugh. Yeah, you know. I used to do that because I used I used to be in improv groups. Uh, I was in two of them in London, and uh, that that was one of my weaknesses. Is when I would make someone laugh, I would love it so much that it would you know and some of the people i was doing improv with were very they were more into getting the story over they were more you know serious and blah blah, blah. But we're doing short form you know you can't really, you can't really do that yeah um you're just there to have a laugh and my I, I, i've been in tears on stage and just mm. loving every single minute of it and I mean, that's what it's all well, about. there's a time I kind of sab- sabotaged Accrington Pals and ended up yeah. having to like face away from the audience because I was just giggling. Yeah, do, <laughs> do, do you know the play Accrington Pals? It's essentially no. um, it's, it's about the First World War. It's about um, a group like the young the young teenagers who got kind of yeah draft like oh, who wow. signed up to 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 go. You yeah. know, the, the first eager eager boys who had no idea what they're getting into yeah. I, I think very few of them came back put it that way yeah um but yeah it's a very very it's a heartbreaking show and it's a very very fun it, it was in tears at the end kind yeah. of show um but we were a very tight-knit cast and we were very like a family and we would do our best to just sabotage it for ourselves as often as we possibly could yeah and like, there's a character and it has to do he, he's he's an artist and, and he's doing a portrait he's working on of his romantic interest i think and, yeah. and um but i i'm actually an artist and so he used to get me to draw certain things beforehand just in case okay. there was the wind of it and so the last show is obviously a penis like i think i was in the matinee with, yeah, so it was all old ladies yeah in the audience and it was just a penis with a smiley face yeah. and he's like look at that yeah. <laughs> and everyone's like oh that's amazing yeah. <laughs> the thing and, is it's given to me it's it's, it's a drawing of my girlfriend oh, yeah, in the show and the line following that is put your lips to it <laughs> put your lips to it and i'll treasure it and it's a, nice. it's a penis mike yeah. and I've got to that line. smiley face 
I think I did it in the audience did see it. They'll just see like a lot of shading, yeah. but the, the the penis was in in yeah. the white space. But regardless, it was a different drawing every night, and it yeah. was all silly. But then my like, yeah, it, it, it's fun. You know, you it's got fun. I'm yeah. horrible that way. Yeah. I did a production of Taming of the Shrew. It was a modernized <laughs> version, but I the, the the lovers and everything were modernized. But the old guys like Grimio, I was Grimio, so I had old age makeup and a ring beard. Like, ah. yeah. And I have to come on and talk to the student to tell him what to talk to say and they go these fancies and it, uh, and it was limericks we would go something from the old irish isles limericks and i would go there once was a man from nantucket and then we would move on you know, that but i would write because he would look at i give him to look at so every day i would write the filthiest limerick you know some i mean and uh some were vile but just to watch him because he was a younger actor yeah. he respected me which was his downfall yeah, you know, because like, don't you know? I mean, you look at I won't well, take Alan Rickman and Michael Gambon when they did Harry Potter. Mm. I guess Daniel Radcliffe had to do the scene where he's like camping out in the church. They have sleeping bags, and there was a a young woman on the set he liked, and they said, "Can you sit, put me next to her so we just you know talk?" <laughs> and they found that out, and they got a fart machine. Oh. And had wardrobe bury it in his sleeping bag, oh, like sew yeah. a pocket so he couldn't find it. And so he gets in, and is doing that, and they're and just footage of them around a prop pillar. Two grown men, nominated for you know doyens of the theater and the stage, going <laughs> and laughing, and you're like, "That's who we are. That's it. That's, That's who it. we are. Why? Why be? Why? Why be?" You know, serious about this sort of thing. You know, I mean, there's time and place to do it, but if you can't well, have a laugh, you know, I guess well, it's still work, isn't it? I don't. Yeah, exactly. I'm not. I'm not serious in my current job at all. No. It's, um... So it's Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Um, um, I don't remember. That's fine. <laughs> I don't remember. It went by so quick. They I think do, I saw really? Johnny Ringtail, and yeah. then it was night. And yeah. oh, it was night. We watched a lot of Gunsmoke, oh, which was, was a series I grew up with. Yeah, uh, yeah. through the 50s and 60s. Actually, it was the longest-running TV series in America mm. up to a point. And we were watching the early black and whites ones because they're sort of taking over from the era of film noir, mm. film noir, and the actors were all film noir actors in the early films. Yeah. And these guys all work in Westerns now. So there's this weird desperado quality that it has. And they're only a half hour long, and so they're very tight moral fables. Really? Um, and uh, so we watched those and were like, wow, that's great, you know. And uh, I love it. Yeah. It. So I haven't seen Gunsmoke. I probably you, should. You probably should. You're a big Western. I like my Westerns and things. I'll Watch the it. early ones with James Arness. Yeah, okay. because he was the star of it. And uh, it's pretty good. I mean, the color ones, you know, it's like there's one they had, this, they went out to an hour and they were good. They got more production hours, they're good. And they were like mini movies. And then they just got, what, what do we do now? You know, and then you feel it. But the first ones, the black and white ones, are a little clumsier, but mm -hmm. a little sterner. But it's kind of cool. It's got a film noir quality to it. Yeah, you might enjoy it. It's great. I mean, I love, I love the fact you can still sit there and watch them after all these years as well. I all mean, the old ones. All the old ones. All the old ones. Yeah, yeah. Even though I haven't. Yeah. But... No, no. Well, which other would... ones? Yes. It's not that one. No, that's right. What you could do is with the newer ones that are in color, just turn the color down on your TV. Just a thought. There we Change go. It. Switch it to black and white. <laughs> switch. Yeah, watch it switch into grayscale. There we go. Hey, look at that. So yeah. that's my week. I love it. I love it. If you were to rate your week out of um, a score of whatever, what would you rate it, Mike? I would rate my score. I would, um, out of a possible seven cat turds in a sandbox on a golf course uh -huh. from Johnny Ringtail, I'd yeah. give him a five. Five loaves. Okay. okay. Substantial then. Enough to cause a problem. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Um, do you Someone's have... going to have to go deal with it. Someone's got to deal with it. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, so, if um, have you got anything you want to promote or boast yes. about? Or go Paul Merton's Impro Chums. We're yeah. all throughout the UK. Look up uh, Mick Perrin worldwide. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's uh, this Mike McShane. That's my Twitter handle. And uh, if you if you're coming to see the show and you want to give me a shout out beforehand or so you're going to be back, come backstage or, you know, come up the stage door and give me to sign stuff. I sign three things at a time for each person. 
if you because you get some things you get. Uh, I've done a hundred signatures of Bugs Life. I don't know how to spell tuck and roll anymore. Um, <laughs> if somebody comes up, you're a big fan, and they give you a hundred things to sign. I go, you're not yeah. really a big fan, dude. You're a I'll merch be, dude. You're. I, you know. I, I, I'll be honest. I I really wanted those toys when I first saw them when I was younger. <laughs> the the two that talk to each other. Yeah, you know, tuck and roll or what? Yeah. Yeah, they uh, one is like 15 milliseconds older than the other one. And the one that does have one full brow, that's the oldest one. And we decided the split brow was the younger one. So, so you can get a dynamic going. There's outtakes. I did like all these ones from John Lasseter where it's just like, they did one where I'm doing the language. So they go cut and he goes, no, he goes, dude, that's not your line. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. And they start bickering, and he goes, "You know what? I, I can't deal with you. I'll be under my trailer." I know. Oh. <laughs> and he crawls in, you know, because he's a pill bug, you know. Yeah. That, and that was the second character you played called Tuck. I just realized. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Tuck and roll. I, hey, Tuck. welcome to Pub Quiz Mastery, my friend. Hey. Mm-hmm. Hey, my career is not an accident, Alex. I can see a pattern. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, it's as I say, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, enjoy the tour, enjoy those cheese and beans and toast. Oh, yeah. And uh, thank you very much, Mike McShane. Uh, Emmy, right any, anything Emmy, to add? Thank you, Emmy. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it's been thank it's you. been lovely to chat. To you. I could chat to you for hours. Oh, we nearly did. Uh, and <laughs> anything to add? Um, no, nothing to add. Fantastic. To add, Wonderful. Ever. Well, that was that was the week that was, was it? Uh, goodbye. Money troubles, stress from work, feeling depressed, nowhere to turn, house burnt down, found an elderly relative's pawn collection after they died. Have a cup of tea. Tea, the British way to reset. <laughs>